send a uh, high temperature plasma at a certain frequency through a sort of a magical material that we call deuterium cortinide. And that's something that, of course, we just invented that term, just made that up. When you're that far out, you can make your own rules, and that's okay, and that's, it's just fun. And if somebody, some kid now in public school can be inspired by that challenge, great. Keep him out of law school. <laughs> Are your navigational readings going crazy? When the warp drive seemed old hat to Star Trek writers, they latched on to another scientific concept gaining popularity, the wormhole. It's now a key element in the third Star Trek television series, Deep Space Nine. One could conceive of ways to warp bend space, provide tubes through hyperspace that connect one part of space with another and then have something move through that tube in hyperspace to another portion of space. It appears right now that these structures in hyperspace, they might be called wormholes, do solve Einstein's general relativity field equations. The wormhole could make trips a little more convenient for interstellar travelers and bring them to Deep Space Nine. But the mainstay of galactic exploration and storytelling is the starship. They come in all sizes and shapes. It all began with the Enterprise and a design that at the time seemed very futuristic. The Enterprise in 1966 was a flying saucer with some aircraft style struts holding up the warp drive and the engineering section. The Enterprise was fueled by a substance almost unheard of at the time, antimatter. Engineering, maintain full power. Full power. Dilithium crystal circuits failing, sir. We'll have to replace it. Not now. It was exotic, mysterious, and seemed like pure science fiction. Check the bypass valve on the matter-antimatter reaction chamber. Actually, it was founded in scientific theory. In the 1950s, the controlled annihilation of matter and antimatter was recognized by German scientist Eugene Sanger as a potential source of rocket fuel. The nice thing about it as fuel is that uh, a very small amount of antimatter uh, corresponds to a large amount of energy. So that, say, a gram of antimatter could, in fact, uh, be enough energy to launch a modest-sized rocket ship off the Earth and into space. NASA could send a whole fleet of starships into the galaxy if it could locate just a couple ounces of antimatter. But with today's technology, even a gram of antimatter is extremely precious. We make 10 billion antimatter particles per hour. Suppose we increase that by a thousandfold. It would take us approximately a million years, running 24 hours a day, day and night, uh, in order to make uh, uh, not a gram, I think I calculated about a thousandth of a gram. But what if we could find an economic way to manufacture antimatter fuel? Would our starships look anything like the Enterprise? This is Captain Jean-Luc Picard's quarters. Spacious, comfortable. T, Earl Grey, hot. It looks more like somebody's personal apartment than the sleeping quarters of a NASA astronaut, even by current standards. But without the physical or technological limitations of real space flight, one can spend a little more time in space on creature comforts. The Enterprise looks impressive, but when considering the practical needs of a real starship, it's out of proportion, according to Dr. Morgan. What I see is a very large portion of it being devoted to crew space, scientific instrumentation. I see very little of it that is devoted to the storage of propellant or even antimatter. Now, the kinds of things that one imagines in regard to antimatter propulsion that go to the stars are going to consist mainly of a tank of hydrogen and some kind of tank if one can produce it of anti-hydrogen. And the payload of the spacecraft is going to be very small in comparison. So a small starship is fine for science fact, but for science fiction, you need room for a cast, crew, and equipment. The film camera and the film camera dolly require a certain amount of finite space. Unless a set is really intended to be cramped, like two people crawling through a tunnel, 
you try to make the set as large as you can to accommodate the equipment so that you're not constantly moving walls in and out in order to put the camera where you'd like to see it. Red alert! Zimmerman's fictional starships are a far cry from the pragmatic designs of a real scientist, but they do look good. Compared with the sleek lines of the Enterprise, even Morgan admits that his starship is a little clunky. You know, when one actually makes something like this sometime in the future, as I think maybe we will, it might look very different than how I've depicted it here. It certainly wouldn't have quite as much color as I have put in here. <laughs> Designing a starship or a space station is one thing. Building it is quite another. NASA engineers would use advanced materials and high-tech instruments. On Star Trek, Zimmerman and his crew do it a little differently. The flooring is vinyl that looks like a metal diamond plate. The uh, rest of it is built out of wood. Uh, this is again a vinyl diamond plate. And the sides are, uh, are actually uh, some plastic objects that uh, are used in the chemical industry to break up sewage in septic tanks. Deception is a key to designing for science fiction. You can take what is familiar and turn it upside down and it doesn't look the same, it still looks familiar but you're not quite sure what it is. A nutmeg grinder. The sockets of a fluorescent tube fixture mounted on salt shakers and a row of high-tech potato peelers. NASA isn't the only space agency searching for cost savings. The Federation relies on the industrial designers of the 20th century. The research and development in designing a chair is really a whole lot of trouble and very expensive. We normally buy automobile chairs and then put a casing around them. That works very well. Making the scene look futuristic and high-tech is a constant challenge for Zimmerman. We use a lot of what I call electronic wallpaper. We use uh, backlit graphics. These panels light up, they blink, they have moving graphics on them. When it all comes together, the design of a Federation starship is very impressive, even to the U.S. government. Some of the members of a company called SAIC, it's a civilian branch of the Defense Department, uh, wanted uh, a command center that they were going to build in Arlington, Virginia. Uh, to look like the bridge of the Starship Enterprise. So uh, December a year ago, uh, six guys in suits came out and uh, interviewed me. 